when Edgar Allan Poe was a young man, he was a cadet at West Point. But he really didn't like it there. He didn't like all of the rules and all the training he had to go through. So one day, when all of the cadets were supposed to turn out in formation on the parade grounds to march for the generals, Edgar Allan Poe checked his rule book to find out what the dress code was for such an occasion. And it said that he was supposed to wear white gloves and a white belt. So that's what he put on white gloves, and a white belt, and nothing else. <laughs> and when the military commanders saw him out there on the parade grounds, they promptly reprimanded him and threw him out of school, which was what he wanted anyway. Now, I don't know about you, but I think it's pretty awful to think of facing the world naked. <laughs> oh, yeah. At least it would be for me. Why do we wear clothes anyway? <laughs> Have you ever thought of that? Well, there are really only two reasons that we wear clothes, and they both start with the letter F, and one is function, and the other is fashion. We wear clothes for privacy and to protect us from the elements. That's function. For example, we wear shoes to keep our feet from getting hurt. First grade teacher tells about a time when her little students came to school and he had his left shoe on his right foot and his right shoe on his left foot and the teacher told the little boy that he had his shoes on the wrong feet. Well, he looked up at her and he started to cry and he said, but teacher, there's the only feet I have. <laughs> we wear shoes to protect our feet and we wear coats to keep us warm in the winter and that's function. Clothes keep us warm and dry, and they protect us from hurting ourselves, but they also make a statement about who we are and how we feel about ourselves. All of this and more is what the Apostle Paul had in mind when he tells us to put on the armor of God. We read from Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, the imagery is really quite vivid. Christians are those who are going out into the world to do battle against evil. So we must dress as soldiers. Now, the soldier Paul has in mind was a first century soldier. Their uniform was more critical than today's soldiers. They didn't have tanks and armored personnel carriers to protect them. They were out in the open. Now, Paul knew a lot about the business of soldiers, and he knew a lot about what they wore for their business. Because while Paul is writing these words, he's got a chain around his right wrist, and the other end of that chain is attached to the left, left wrist of a soldier. Paul mentions that chain in, in the 20th verse in this chapter. He said that he's a man in chains. 
It means he's chained to a Roman soldier. And if Paul were that close to a soldier every day, day in and day out, he would certainly know what the soldier was wearing. So he calls us soldiers in God's army, fighting evil around us every day. And in order to do that, Paul says, we should put on six pieces of clothing. First, Paul says, there's the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. The belt that that Paul's talking about here isn't meant to hold up a soldier's pants. Paul looked at the soldier next to him. He would see a man who used his belt in a different way. You see, the soldiers were, would wear a, a loose and, and floppy kind of a shirt, if you will, a tunic. And that tunic was meant to be loose so that when the soldier was marching or exercising or doing his daily work, he wouldn't get too warm. But, but if the soldier ever had to go into battle, this loose and floppy tunic could get in the way. It, it could give his opponent something to grab, to pull him, to pull him down. So the soldier wore a belt. And he used the belt to keep all of his clothing tight so as not to get caught or grabbed. And you must wear a belt too, says Paul. It's the belt of truth. If you wear the belt of truth, you don't give your opponent something to grab onto. Trouble with stretching the truth, somebody said, is that it sometimes snaps back. A belt of truth and a breastplate of righteousness. Now, it shouldn't be too difficult to visualize a breastplate of righteousness. It, it's kind of like a goalie wears in hockey or the umpire and the catcher wear in baseball. They, they wear this protection over the top part of their bodies against the hockey pucks and the baseballs that might hit them otherwise. Now, Roman soldiers wore a smaller breastplate. It was usually made of metal, but sometimes it was made of a very thick leather. And it was meant to protect their heart and their lungs and their stomachs from injury. Truth and righteousness. Those are the belt and the breastplate of Christian. There's no place for for pretense or hypocrisy or selfishness in Christian living. Living out our faith is serious business. We are soldiers of Christ. We're called to walk the talk and talk the walk. When we take seriously our task as soldiers, we, it shows. It shows in, in our places of work. It shows in how we treat our families. It shows in how we treat people of, of other religions, other beliefs, other races. Integrity is the word. But sadly, so sadly, all too often, honesty and integrity and humility are not the first things people see in those who profess to be Christians. The belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. And the third and fourth pieces of clothing that we should wear, Paul says, are the shoes of the gospel of peace and the shield of faith. Now, a Roman soldier's footwear was supposed to be sturdy, and they were supposed to have good grips on the bottom so that they could stand well on all kinds of surfaces. With those on, they don't need to worry about keeping their footing, just as the gospel gives us firm footing as we seek to live for Christ. Now, the Roman shield that Paul refers to here isn't, isn't just a small personal shield. Paul uses a word that refers to this big oblong shield that the Roman soldiers used really for two purposes. On one hand, it was big enough that if they could crouch down and get behind it, it would protect their whole body from from the swords and spears that were being thrown at it. But the second part about this shield I didn't realize, I found this interesting, was that each shield had grooves at the edges so that it could be fitted to the next soldier's shield, and so on, the next soldier's. And so they could have a wall, if you will, of these shields protecting them as they moved forward. So I was thinking about that as a family of faith, if you will, the Christian Christian community the strength that we have together. We're not in this fight alone. We have one another. 
In one of his great children's fantasies, George MacDonald tells about a girl who grew up in a messy home where everyone was angry and mean and selfish, and her hair never got brushed, so they called her Tangle. And her clothes were never clean, even though they were the typical fashions of the world. And one day, Tangle was sent away from her home, and she was left alone and hungry in the great forest. She would have died if, if she hadn't been led by a kind bird to a house in the middle of the forest. And there she met a kind woman, and the kind woman took her in. And she gave Tangle a delicious meal, and she washed Tangle's clothes, and, and she gave Tangle a place to sleep. And when Tangle woke up in the next morning, she sent Tangle out on a great journey with many strange experiences, and her new clothes helped her along the way till she finally came to a palace so beautiful that she stayed there forever. But you know, George MacDonald's story is really not just about a little girl at all. He's writing about you and me. He's talking about the homes that we have in this world, not just our homes, but the home of the world itself, which is often mean and ugly and unkind. And it can make us feel dirty and alone and helpless. But there is a kind lady in this world. She is the church the church of Jesus Christ, and the church bathes us in the waters of baptism, and the church feeds us with the word of God and with sacrament, and the church helps us to put on these clothes that Paul talks about, and the church sends us out on many adventures till one day we find ourselves in the very palace of God. It's a wonderful story, and it's happening to you and me right now, but, but the thing is, we're still traveling with Tangle. We haven't arrived yet at the palace. And what we need to help us along the way is the armor that God gives us, the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace and the shield of faith, pieces of clothing that protect us. And Paul goes on to the pieces of clothing, number five and six, are the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Oh, you know how important a helmet is. I mean, we wear helmets to protect our most vital organ, our brain. The helmet of salvation is ultimate protection. It's that sense of security that we have, that we're surrounded by God's love, knowing that Christ died for our sins, and that there is nothing in the world that can ever take that away from us. The helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, Paul tells us, is the word of God. Now, according to many scholars, when the word of God is used in the New Testament, it doesn't refer to just the scriptures. After all, the, the sacred writings weren't gathered into the collection that we know as the Bible until a long time later. Generally, the word of God refers to the word God gives us to speak, especially in times of crisis. In one of his books, Norman Vincent Peale tells a story that appeared in a Chattanooga, Tennessee newspaper about four women in a dress shop. Three were clerks and one was a customer. And the customer was in the dressing room and she was putting on her clothes after having tried on several dresses. And all of a sudden the shop door bursts open and a big guy comes in with a gun in one hand and a knife in the other. Hand over your money, he hollers at him. And the three clerks all together, all they could come up with was $55. And it made him mad. And he said, lie down on the floor. Don't move. If you move, I'll shoot you. And then he heard that woman in the dressing room. And he pushed the door open. And he started to manhandle her. And he took all of her money. And finally, she, she got the gumption, if you will. She felt the spirit of God moving within her. She stood to full height. And she said in a very strong and authoritative voice, Stop this in the name of Jesus Christ. I command you to leave us alone. Stop this wickedness. And the thief was totally astonished. He, he just kind of stopped in his tracks and he turned and he ran out of the shop and he jumped into a car that a woman accomplice was at the wheel of and they sped away. And later he was captured by the police and when he was interrogated he said, that woman had a power like none I've ever seen before. That lady was wielding the sword of the Spirit. 
God gave her the word to speak, and she spoke it. All of the other components in the armor of God, if you think about it, are defensive. But the sword of the Spirit, that is our offensive weapon against the evil that comes against us. The point of the armor of God is really this. It's a question of our identity. Who are you really? Do you think of yourself as an ambassador of Christ when you, when you leave here? Because if you don't, those, those images really don't, they're kind of lost on you. If you just view yourself as an ordinary Joe or Jane or who lives a very ordinary life, who comes to church for a weekly feel-good, you know, spiritual bath, then you might not need the armor of God. You can go out dressed however you want. But if you believe that there is some importance in bearing the name of Jesus Christ, if you're going from this place determined to live for him, determined to make your world a little bit better, a place of peace and truth, love and kindness and forgiveness, then you need to dress appropriately with that belt of truth and that breastplate of righteousness those shoes of the gospel of peace and that shield of salvation. Helmet of salvation, shield of faith, wrong, wrong way around. And that sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And finally, after all of those pieces are in place, Paul tells you to pray. Pray. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with that in mind, be alert. And keep on praying for one another. I've heard it said that, that the armor equips and protects us, but that prayer is the actual battle. Now, I don't have to tell any of you here that there is evil in this world. You already know it. I don't have to tell you that sometimes it feels as though the enemy has the upper hand. But if you put on your armor every day, we are called to be trendsetters, if you will, and difference makers until the day comes when this world becomes the kingdom of God and a kingdom of peace, justice, and dignity under the discipleship and the lordship of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask you, have you got your armor on? The enemy is out there. You all know that. And he'll come at you differently than he'll come at me. He, got, he knows our weaknesses. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Shooting his fiery darts, when you've got your armor in place, they just bounce off. Have you got your armor on? Amen. <laughs>